Hey guys, Super Horror Bro Mike here, and in today's video, we take a look at the story of the Amanda Curse, including a look at each of the game's four unique endings. This game features a very peculiar art style, with both humans and humanoid animals coexisting together in society. But, like any good horror game, there exists a villain in this tale, one with a dark plan to break the peace and bring terror to his fellow townsfolk. So sit back, relax, and let's explore the story of the Vermanda Curse, looking over each of its final outcomes. JP Vermander is a wealthy landowner who inherited his family's estate and now owns a substantial amount of the neighbouring town. Despite making large sums of money from local businesses who operate on land Mr. Vermanda owns, he is never happy and always looking for a way to cut corners and make more cash. One evening, JP Vermander questions his downtrodden assistant Hannah as to why the monthly profits are not as high as the last. She informs him that this is because he didn't qualify for a charitable tax deduction after the threshold was raised. Upon discovering this, JP Vermander angrily inquires where his donations have been going. Hannah tells him they have been sent to the local hospital, and so the cruel landowner begins to direct his anger on the hospital staff, proclaiming, The only hospital in this godforsaken backwater town, and they still have the nerve to swindle me out of my money. Prepare the ritual, Hannah. Go fetch my robes. The ritual Vermanda refers to involves summoning a powerful demon, which has long served his family and has been kept under their control through a blood pact. Now forced to carry out the twisted bidding of the Vermanda bloodline whenever called upon. Hannah pleads for her boss to reconsider, worrying for the safety of a hospital staff and patients. She also reminds him that the difference in profits between the last month and current month are just 1%. But greedy JP Vermander has made up his mind, and the demon is summoned. We now move over to the hospital and meet its quirky cast of characters, all unknowingly about to be plunged into a night of survival horror. Nurse Morton is first on the scene, a new recruit who has just transferred to the hospital. He is greeted by Dr. Ida, an elderly member of staff in charge of running the hospital and caring for its patients. Nurse Eder explains that she wasn't aware of Morton's transfer because the hospital doesn't get regular internet. In fact, even the satellite connection is a little wonky. This lack of communication is especially unfortunate when we consider there is an incoming demon about to raise hell at their location. Despite this mix-up, Dr. Eder is happy to have Nurse Morton to help her out, and begins to give him a quick guided tour around the building, introducing him to the various patients currently on the ward and the different rooms available. These three patients include Mr. Lang Boyd, who received a back injury after falling from a ladder while trying to clean the gutters on the roof of his family home. Accompanying Mr. Boyd is his wife Jasmine, who is both protective of her husband while also being frustrated by his stubborn attitude. The next patient is an octopus called Jane Doe. This is of course not her real name, but rather an alias given to her as no one knows her true identity. Jane cut her hand at her job and so was sent to heal up at the hospital by her employer. The third and final patient is an axolotl named Tammy Giles, who has been admitted to the hospital to have her teeth pulled. Due to a lack of proper anaesthetic, the doctor remarks that old-fashioned medicine was used instead. A side effect of this is that it causes Tammy to wander from her room in a daze. Once the tour is complete, the duo head back to the hospital reception, and Dr. Ida leaves Morton in charge of a front desk while she completes her rounds. While Dr. Eder is talking with her patients, Nurse Morton suddenly interrupts to announce they have received a strange and troubling phone call. The caller is Hannah, who warns of JP Vermander's diabolical plan to take revenge on the hospital for his 1% loss of income by summoning a ferocious entity upon them. Hannah explains they have until the stroke of 10pm to get out of the building before it's too late. Unfortunately, as Dr. Eda states, that simply isn't enough time to evacuate the patients. 
With this in mind, Hannah advises that they attempt to survive until sunrise. If they can keep the demon at bay until the sun rises over the town, the ritual cannot complete and they will be safe from the Manda's wrath. However, in order to do this, a series of tasks must be performed. The first of these tasks is to ensure that all windows are closed. Windows are periodically opened each hour by the entity as it attempts to breach the perimeter. Closing them halts its progress. The next thing to check are the many television sets found throughout the hospital rooms. If these are found on with static on the screen, they must be quickly turned off. The demon seemingly manages to enter the hospital through the static broadcast of the screen, but turning these TVs off prevents this. Thirdly, the demon uses flickering lights to gain power and grow stronger. Nurse Morton and Dr. Ida must enter the room, close the door, and then shut their eyes, focusing on stopping the light with the power of their mind to quell the demon's rise. The fourth way the demon tries to gain entry to the hospital is via the power of electronics. It can travel down phone lines to gain this power. Upon answering a ringing phone, if we hear a breathing or murmuring sound on the other end, we must recite the following mantra. Your presence is not welcome here. You must depart immediately. Doing so will banish the demon and block it from using the phone as a power source. However, if we hear no sound when answering the call, then it is best to stay quiet, so as not to give away the phone's location. The final task is the most eerie. Lit candles begin to appear in the halls and rooms of the hospital and invite the entity inside if not extinguished upon discovery. Things are only complicated further by the patients themselves. Stubborn Mr. Lang Boyd will come to reception to ask about his meds if they are not administered at the correct time. Tammy often leaves her room and appears elsewhere on the ward meaning we must send her back to bed for her own safety. Finally, Jane Doe requires pain medication, and if we don't provide it, she leaves the room and falls victim to the demon. It is important to keep up conversation with these patients and provide them with the care they need, until they eventually fall asleep in the early hours of the morning. If we don't, then they will fall prey to the unwanted visitor. We get extra snippets of backstory for these characters if they are consumed by the entity. Here's a quick read-through of each of these backstories. Jane Doe had done all she could to hide her injury from others. Her reasoning was driven by the knowledge that even a simple hospital visit could result in her never seeing her family again. Unfortunately for her, this fear was realised by entirely different means. On the day of his accident, Lang Boyd's mind was not on the potential consequences of his actions. Far from it, in fact. His mind was instead on how happy his wife and children would be after he cooked their favourite dinner. A dinner that he could not afford to make unless he used the money he'd saved by cleaning the gutters himself. The grandest intentions had now unintentionally doomed their entire family. Under normal circumstances, Tammy Giles was known as an awkward and shy person. She hadn't wanted to visit the hospital, quite the opposite. It was only when her tooth pain became unbearable that she finally made up her mind to have it pulled, a decision that would ultimately be one of her last. After these tasks have been completed and before the hour is up, the doctor and nurse must return to the reception area, the room they were in when the ritual commenced. At the top of the hour, the demon enters to seek out a fresh victim, but so long as all the rules have been followed and tasks completed, it will leave again empty-handed. This process must be repeated every hour until 5am, when the sun rises and one of four possible conclusions to this story unlock. So now with the basic premise explained, let's take a look at each ending. There are four main outcomes to unlock by the end of a night shift in the Vermanda Curse, although there are several variables which slightly alter these endings. For example, referencing a different victim in the ending text. But with that in mind, this video will focus on a look at the four main endings without going over every possible variable. 
The most morbid ending unlockable in the Vermander Curse is surely the ending where the demon claims everyone on the ward. If we allow everyone to fall to the roaming entity, then the following ending plays out. No one could make sense of it. Both Dr. Ida and Nurse Morton had suddenly disappeared without a trace. No signs of a struggle, no signs of force entry, and absolutely no clues as to where they'd gone. They had both simply vanished. Without Dr. Ida to run things, the hospital that had faithfully served the community for decades stood abandoned. Now unable to get the medical help they so heavily relied on, the town suffered. But no one suffered as much as Morton's now orphaned daughter. She was now alone in a completely unfamiliar town, with no idea what could have possibly happened to her father. The truth, however, was only known by Hannah. She feared what might have happened should Vermanda ever figure out her involvement in trying to prevent his plan. What she wanted more than anything was to pack up, leave town, and go somewhere very far away. Somewhere she could be safe. But her meager salary as a secretary didn't allow for this. So she continued on working for someone she both feared and despised, too afraid of what he may do should she try to quit. With Hannah's silence, no one could ever tie the disappearances back to anyone or anything. And JP Vermander got away without consequence. Untold amounts of misfortune had been brought upon the small town. But in the end, Vermander got to keep his extra 1%. And that's all that mattered. The second ending can be unlocked if we keep both Nurse Morton and Dr. Ida alive, but allow any number of patients under their care to be taken by the demon. If this happens, then the following ending plays out, with variables in the text description dependent on who perished during the night. The sun began to rise upon our little town, and the demon could not stay in this world for much longer. It had already fulfilled its side of the pact so it departed from the world back to whence it came. Dr. Eder and Nurse Morton had both survived. They were finally safe. However, an investigation into the two different disappearances that happened that night was launched. An investigation that was compromised by Vermander's influence. Despite their innocence and a lack of evidence, both Ida and Morton were charged and convicted in connection with the disappearances. Without Dr. Ida to run things, the hospital that had faithfully served the community for decades now stood abandoned. Unable to get the medical help that they so heavily relied on, the town suffered. But none had suffered as much as Morton's daughter, who suddenly had to grow up without her father. She was all alone in a completely unfamiliar town, all through no fault of her own. The only other person who knew the truth left was Hannah, but soon she too had suddenly disappeared. And upon searching her home, the only thing found was a strange lit candle. In the end, JP Vermanda got to keep his extra 1%, and that's all that mattered. Throughout the story of the Vermander curse, we are warned by helpful accomplice Hannah of the demon reaching its full power and potential. This occurs if we fail to halt its attempts to enter the hospital and gain access to various power sources. It is vital to extinguish candles, turn off TV sets, close windows, and stop lights from flickering. But what if we don't? Failing these tasks three times allows the demon to reach its full strength, and the following ending unlocks. The demon was able to draw power for a third and final time, which enabled it to fully manifest. There would be no stopping it now. With its power fully realized, the demon was no longer limited to the confines of the hospital it was summoned to. One can imagine the destruction a powerful, all-seeing demon could bring upon a small and unsuspecting town. 
This compounded with the fact that the only hospital in the area was now out of commission. It led to one of the darkest nights in the town's entire history. Though in the end, JP Vermanda got to keep his extra 1%. And that's all that mattered. Finally, we come to the good ending. This is by far the longest and most conclusive of the endings, and is unlocked by fulfilling all tasks correctly, both preventing the demon from powering up and spilling any blood to complete the ritual. By saving everyone on the ward, the following sequence of events occurs. The sun began to rise upon our little town, and the demon could not stay in this world for much longer. However, in direct violation of the Vermanda Pact, no blood had been spilt that night. The most important part of the pact had not been fulfilled, which meant that the agreement was now null and void. After generations of being enslaved to the Vermanda family, the demon was finally free. And though it did not have much time left, it knew exactly how it wished to spend its final moments. Hannah, what in the world are you doing back here this early? Oh, it's you. Don't you have some work to be doing? What do you want? Why are you looking at me like that? Don't you go forgetting that you work for me, mister. I command you to get out of here. Why won't you listen to me, you stupid? The angry howls of the demon echoed through the town that morning, and then the estate fell deathly quiet. As it turned out, Hannah hadn't left the Vermanda estate that previous night. She had been far too tired to return home after feeding instructions through the phone all night. Instead, she fell asleep in one of the manor's empty rooms. She was awakened by awful noises emitting from upstairs. Hannah climbed the stairs and quickly made her way over to the office. Inside, there lie J.P. Vermanda, beaten and moving and absolutely mangled. But against all odds, he was still alive. Hannah had a choice to make. A large part of her wanted to simply leave him there, to give him the same disrespect and disregard that he showed to others. She turned to leave. But, deep down, she knew that this wasn't the right thing to do. As bad as he was, she would not stoop to his level. So instead, she called for help. In an ironic turn of events, J.P. Vermander's life was saved at the very same hospital he tried to rid himself of. Despite their rightful and justified anger at the man, Dr. Ida and Nurse Morton treated him no differently than any other patient and he was soon on a road to full recovery. During his stay in the hospital, he was given a room near the front. Day after day, he watched the patients as they came and went. He watched as the hospital's only doctor and sole nurse did their best to help every person that came through its doors. And as he watched, he realized something. Those confusing numbers on that little piece of paper actually meant something. Those numbers represented actual people. People with lives and emotions. People that just wanted to get the help they deserved. It took a near-death experience at the hands of an angry demon and an intensive stay in the hospital. But JP finally felt something that no other Vermander had felt in a very long time. Remorse. And he vowed he would do everything in his power to try and make amends. However, due to the pact being broken, most of the wealth and power it granted was soon lost to crippling debt. With no other options, JP sold off his estate and assets to pay his dues, and the last remaining bit of his fortune was donated to the hospital. As a sign of goodwill, Dr. Ida let him stay in one of their vacant rooms until he could get back on his feet. He is currently working as a food delivery driver to make ends meet, as he wasn't qualified for anything else. 
Though he does miss his money and his old lifestyle, in the end, he's just thankful to still be alive. Morton settled into his new job as nurse just fine. Despite the rough first night, he grew to love the strange new town and its people. In the end, he knew that the decision to move here was the best one for both him and his daughter. Ida is still the best and only doctor in town. She plans to use the donation money to renovate the hospital so that they can provide the best care possible for years and years ahead. And now they have an actual budget, she decided to hire on an accountant. Hannah happily accepted the position as her old job was no longer available. She's glad to finally have a boss that appreciates her hard work. And though it took a while, she did eventually forgive Bamanda for all of his misdeeds. The hospital had a bright future ahead of it, and everyone was on good terms. And that's all that mattered. And so, with the pesky landowner and his demon finally dealt with, we come to the end of this look at the story of the Vermanda Curse Explained. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it both entertaining and informative. If you did, then remember to leave a like, comment down below, and of course subscribe for more horror-related content. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on the next video.